News of this incident was misreported to the Muslim emigrants in Abyssinia. They were informed that the whole of Quraysh had embraced Islam so they made their way back home. They arrived in Mecca and Shawal of the same year. When they were only an hour's travel from Mecca, the reality of the situation was discovered. Some of them returned to Abyssinia, others sneaked secretly into the city, or went in publicly but under the tutelage of a local notable. However, due to the news that transpired to the Meccans about the good hospitality and warm welcome that the Muslims were accorded in Abyssinia, the polytheists got terribly indignant and started to mete out severer and more horrible maltreatment and tortures to the Muslims. Thereupon the messenger of all deemed it imperative to permit the helpless creatures to seek asylum in Abyssinia for the second time. Migration this time was not as easy as it was the previous time, for Quraysh was on the alert to the least suspicious moves of the Muslims. In due course, however, the Muslims managed their affairs too fast for the Quraishites to thwart their attempt of escape. The group of emigrants this time comprised 83 men and 19 or, in some versions, 18 women. Whether or not Omar was included is still a matter of doubt. Quraysh's machination against the emigrants Quraysh could not tolerate the prospect of a secure haven available for the Muslims in Abyssinia, so they dispatched two staunch envoys to demand their extradition. They were Amr bin Alaz and Abdullah bin Abi Rabi, before embracing Islam. They had taken with them valuable gifts to the king and his clergy, and had been able to win some of the courtiers over to their side. The pagan envoys claimed that the Muslim refugees should be expelled from Abyssinia and made over to them, on the ground that they had abandoned the religion of their forefathers, and their leader was preaching a religion different from theirs and from that of the king. The king summoned the Muslims to the court and asked them to explain the teachings of their religion. The Muslim emigrants had decided to tell the whole truth whatever the consequences were. Jafar bin Abi Talib stood up and addressed the king in the following words. O king! We were plunged in the depth of ignorance and barbarism, we adored idols, we lived in unchastity, we ate the dead bodies, and we spoke abominations, we disregarded every feeling of humanity, and the duties of hospitality and neighborhood were neglected, we knew no law but that of the strong, when all raised among us a man, of whose birth, truthfulness, honesty, and purity we were aware, and he called to the oneness of all, and taught us not to associate anything with him. He forbade us the worship of idols, and he enjoined us to speak the truth, to be faithful to our trusts, to be merciful and to regard the rights of the neighbors and kith and kin. He forbade us to speak evil of women, or to eat the substance of orphans. He ordered us to fly from the vices, and to abstain from evil, to offer prayers, to render alms, and to observe fast. We have believed in him, we have accepted his teachings and his injunctions to worship all, and not to associate anything with him, and we have allowed what he has allowed, and prohibited what he has prohibited. For this reason, our people have risen against us, have persecuted us in order to make us forsake the worship of all, and return to Tihi worship of idols and other abominations. They have tortured and injured us, until finding no safety among them, we have come to your country and hope you will protect us from oppression. The king was very much impressed by these words and asked the Muslims to recite some of all. S. Revelation Jafar recited the opening verses of S. On Mariam wherein is told the story of the birth of both John and Jesus Christ, down to the account of Mary having been fed with the food miraculously. Thereupon the king, along with the bishops of his realm, was moved to tears that rolled down his cheeks and even wet his beard. Here, the Negus exclaimed, It seems as if these words and those which were revealed to Jesus are the rays of the light which have radiated from the same source. Turning to the crestfallen envoys of Quraysh, he said, I am afraid I cannot give you back these refugees. They are free to live and worship in my realm as they please. On the morrow, the two envoys again went to the king and said that Muhammad and his followers blasphemed Jesus Christ. Again the Muslims were summoned and asked what they thought of Jesus. Jafar again stood up and replied, We speak about Jesus as we have been taught by our prophet, that is, he is the servant of all, his messenger, his spirit and his word breathed into Virgin Mary. The king at once remarked, Even so do we believe. Blessed be you, and blessed be your master. 
Then turning to the frowning envoys and to his bishops who got angry, he said, You may fret and fume as you like, but Jesus is nothing more than what Jafar has said about him. He then assured the Muslims of full protection. He returned to the envoys of Quraysh, the gifts they had brought with them, and sent them away. The Muslims lived in Abyssinia unmolested for a number of years till they returned to Medina. In this way Quraysh's malicious intentions recoiled on them, and their machination met with utter failure. They came to fully realize that the grudge they nursed against the Muslims would not operate but within their realm of Mecca. They consequently began to entertain a horrible idea of silencing the advocate of the new call once and for all, through various channels of brutality, or else killing him. An obstinate difficulty, however, used to curtail any move in this direction embodied by the Prophet's uncle Abu Talib and the powerful social standing he used to enjoy as well as the full protection and support he used to lend to his nephew. The pagans of Mecca therefore decided to approach Abu Talib for the second time and insisted that he put a stop to his nephew's activities, which if allowed unchecked, they said, would involve him into severe hostility. Abu Talib was deeply distressed at this open threat and the breach with his people and their enmity, but he could not afford to desert the messenger too. He sent for his nephew and told him what the people had said. Spare me and yourself and put not burden on me that I can't bear. Upon this the prophet thought that his uncle would let him down and would no longer support him, so he replied, O oh my uncle! By all! If they put the sun in my right hand and the moon in my left on condition that I abandon this course, until all has made me victorious, or I perish therein, I would not abandon it. The prophet got up, and as he turned away, his uncle called him and said, Come back, my nephew. And when he came back, he said, Go and preach what you please, for by all, I will never forsake you. He then recited two lines of verse pregnant with meanings of full support to the prophet and absolute gratification by the course that his nephew had chalked out in Arabia. Once more Quraysh approaches Abu Talib Quraysh, seeing that the messenger of all was still intent on his call, realized that Abu Talib would never forsake his nephew even if this incurred their enmity. Some of them then went to see him once more taking with them a youth called Amara bin al-Walid bin al-Magira, and said, O oh, Abu Talib, we have brought you a smart boy still in the bloom of his youth, to make use of his mind and strength and take him as your son in exchange for your nephew, who has run counter to your religion, brought about social discord, found fault with your way of life, so that we kill him and rid you of his endless troubles, just man for man. Abu Talib's reply was, It is really an unfair bargain. You give me your son to bring him up and I give you my son to kill him. By all, it is something incredible. al bin Adi, a member of the delegation, interrupted saying that Quraysh had been fair in that bargain because they meant only to rid you of that source of hateful trouble, but as I see you are determined to refuse their favors. Abu Talib, of course, turned down all their offers and challenged them to do whatever they pleased. Historical resources do not give the exact date of these two meetings with Abu Talib. They, however, seem more likely to have taken place in the sixth year of prophethood with a brief lapse of time in between. The tyrant's decision to kill the prophet now that all the schemes and conspiracies of Quraysh had failed, they resorted to their old practices of persecution and inflicting tortures on the Muslims in a more serious and brutal manner than ever before. They also began to nurse the idea of killing the prophet. In fact, contrary to their expectations, this new method and this very idea served indirectly to consolidate the call to Islam and support it with the conversion of two staunch and mighty heroes of Mecca, i.e. Hamza bin Abdul Muttalib and Umar bin Al-Khattab. Utaiba bin Abi Lahab once approached the Prophet and most defiantly and brazenly shouted at him, I disbelieve in, by the star when it goes down, and in, then he approached and came closer. In other words, I do not believe in any of the cur. He then started to deal high-handedly with Muhammad and laid violent hand on him, tore his shirt and spat into his face, but his saliva missed the holy face of the Prophet. Thereupon, the Prophet invoked all. As wrath on Utaiba and supplicated, O oh, all, set one of your dogs on him. All responded positively to Muhammad's supplication, and it happened in the following manner. Once Utaiba with some of his compatriots from Quraysh set out for Syria and took accommodation in Azizarqa. 
There a lion approached the group to the great fear of Iba, who at once recalled Muhammad's words in supplication, and said, Woe to my brother! This lion will surely devour me just as Muhammad supplicated. He has really killed me in Syria while he is in Mecca. The lion did really rush like lightning, snatched Iba from amongst his people, and crushed his head. It is also reported that a wretched idolater from Quraysh, named Akbar bin Abi Mu'it, once trod on the Prophet's neck while he was prostrating himself in prayer until his eyes protruded. More details reported by Ibn Ishaq testified to the tyrant's deeply established intentions of killing the Prophet. Abu Jal, the archenemy of Islam, once addressed some of his accomplices. O oh, people of Quraysh! It seems that Muhammad is determined to go on finding fault with our religion degrading our forefathers, discrediting our way of life and abusing our gods. I bear witness to our God that I will carry a too heavy rock and drop it on Muhammad's head while he is in prostration to rid you of him, once and for all. I am not afraid of whatever his sept, Banu Abidi Minif, might do. The terrible unfortunate audience endorsed his plan and encouraged him to translate it into a decisive deed. In the morning of the following day, Abu Jal lay waiting for the arrival of the messenger of all to offer prayer. The people of Quraysh were in their assembly rooms waiting for news. When the prophet prostrated himself, Abu Jal proceeded carrying the big rock to fulfill his wicked intention. No sooner had he approached closer to the prophet than he would draw pale-faced, shuddering with his hands strained the rock falling off. Thereupon, the people watching hurried forward asking him what the matter was. He replied, when I approached, a male camel unusual in figure with fearful canines intercepted and almost devoured me. Ibn Ishaq reported that the prophet, in the context of his comment on the incident, said, It was Gabriel. If Abu Jal had approached closer, he would have killed him. Even so the tyrants of Quraysh would not be admonished, contrarywise. The idea of killing the prophet was still being nourished in their iniquitous hearts. On the authority of Abdullah bin Amr bin al az some people of Quraysh were in a place called al hijr complaining that they had been too patient with the Prophet, who suddenly appeared and began his usual circumambulation. They started to wink at him and utter sarcastic remarks, but he remained silent for two times, then on the third, he stopped and addressed the infidels, saying, O people of Quraysh, hearken, I swear by all, in whose hand is my soul? that you will one day be slaughtered to pieces. As soon as the prophet uttered his word of slaughter, they all stood aghast and switched off to a new style of language smacking of fear and even horror trying to soothe his anger and comfort him, saying, You can leave a Bulkasim, for you have never been foolish. Erwud bin Azizabar narrated, I asked Abdullah bin Amr bin Alas to tell me of the worst thing that the pagans did to the prophet. He said, while the Prophet was praying in al hijr of al kaaba Akba bin al muaid came and put his garment around the Prophet's neck and throttled him violently. Abu Bakr came and caught him by his shoulder and pushed him away from the Prophet and said, Do you want to kill a man just because he says, My Lord is all? The conversion of Hamza bin Abdul Muttalib in a gloomy atmosphere infested with dark clouds of iniquity and tyranny, there shone on the horizon a promising light for the oppressed i.e. the conversion of Hamza bin Abdul Muttalib bin Tul Hijjah, the sixth year of prophethood. It is recorded that the prophet was one day seated on the hillock of Safa when Abu Jal happened to pass by and accuse the religion preached by him. Muhammad, however, kept silent and did not utter a single word. Abu Jal went on unchecked, took a stone and cracked the prophet's head which began to bleed. The aggressor then went to join the Quraishites in their assembly place. It so happened that shortly after that, Hamza, while returning from a hunting expedition, passed by the same way, his bow hanging by his shoulder. A slave girl belonging to Abdullah bin Jadin, who had noted the impertinence of Abu Jal, told him the whole story of the attack on the Prophet. On hearing that, Hamza was deeply offended and hurried to al kaaba and there, in the courtyard of the Holy Sanctuary, found Abu Jal sitting with a company of Quraishites. Hamza rushed upon him and struck his bow upon his head violently and said, Ah, you have been abusing Muhammad. I too follow his religion and profess what he preaches. The men of Bani Maksim came to his help, and men of Bani Hashim wanted to render help. But Abu Jal sent them away saying, Let Abu Umrah alone, by all. I did revile his nephew shamelessly. 
In fact, Hans's conversion derived initially from the pride of a man who would not accept the notion of others humiliating his relative. Later on, however, all purified his nature and he managed to grasp the most trustworthy handhold. He proved to be a source of great strength to the Islamic faith and its followers. The conversion of Umar bin al-Khattab Another significant addition to the strength of Islam was the conversion of Umar bin al-Khattab in Dhul Hijjah, the sixth year of prophethood, three days following the conversion of Hamza. He was a man of dauntless courage and resolution, feared and respected in Mecca and hitherto a bitter opponent of the new religion. The traditional account reveals that the Prophet once raised his hands in prayer and said, O oh all, give strength to Islam especially through either of two men you love more, Umar bin al-Khattab or Abu Jal bin Hisham. Umar, obviously, was the one who merited that privilege. When we scrutinize the several versions that speak of Umar's conversion, we can safely conclude that various contradictory emotions used to conflict with one another within his soul. On the one hand, he used to highly regard the traditions of his people, and was habituated to the practice of indulgence in wine orgies. On the other hand, he greatly admired the stamina of the Muslims and their relentless dedication to their faith. These two extreme views created a sort of skepticism in his mind and made him at times tend to believe that the doctrines of Islam could bear better and more sacred seeds of life. That is why he would always experience fits of outrage directly followed by unexpected enervation. On the whole, the account of his conversion is very interesting and requires us to go into some details. One day, Umar bin al-Khattab set out from his house and headed for the holy sanctuary where he saw the prophet offering prayer and overheard him reciting the S. A'alh, Ka of the noble Kur, the words of all, appealed to him and touched the innermost cells of his heart. He felt that they derived from unusual composition, and he began to question his people's allegations as regards the man-composed poetry or words of a soothsayer that they used to attach to the noble Kur. The prophet went on to recite, that this is verily the word of an honored messenger. It is not the word of a poet, little is that you believe. Nor is it the word of a soothsayer, little is that you remember. This is the revelation sent down from the Lord of the Alamin. At that very moment, Islam permeated his heart. However, the dark layer of pre-Islamic tendencies, the deep-seated traditional bigotry as well as the blind pride in his forefathers overshadowed the essence of the great truth that began to feel its way reluctantly into his heart. He, therefore, persisted in his atrocities against Islam and its adherents unmindful of the pure and true to man's nature feeling that lay behind that fragile cover of pre-Islamic ignorance and mentality. His sharp temper and excessive enmity towards the Prophet led him one day to leave his house, sword in hand with the intention of killing the prophet. He was in a fit of anger, and was fretting and fuming. Nuim bin Abdullah, a friend of Umar's, met him accidentally halfway. What had caused so much excitement in him, and on whom was the fury to burst, he inquired casually. Umar said furiously, To destroy the man Muhammad this apostate, who has shattered the unity of Quraysh, picked holes in their religion, found folly with their wise men and blasphemed their gods. Umar, I am sure, your soul has deceived you. Do you think that Banu Abd Minif would let you walk on earth if you slain Muhammad? Why don't you take care of your own family first and set them right? Which of the folk of my house? asked Umar angrily. Your brother-in-law and your sister have apostatized and abandoned your religion. Umar directed his footsteps to his sister's house. As he drew near, he heard the voice of Kababab bin Arit, who was reading the Kur. I see chapter T, H, I to both of them. Kababab, perceiving the noise of his footsteps, retired to a closet. Fatima, Umar's sister, took hold of the leaf and hid it. But Umar had already heard the voice. What sound was that I have heard just now? Shouted the son of Kitab, entering angrily. Both his sister and her husband replied. You heard nothing. Nay, said he swearing fiercely. I have heard that you have apostatized. He plunged forward towards his brother-in-law and beat him severely, but Fatima rushed to the rescue of her husband. Thereupon, Umar fell upon his sister and struck upon her head. The husband and wife could not contain themselves and cried aloud. Yes, we are Muslims, we believe in all. 
and his messenger Muhammad so do what you will. When Umar saw the face of his dear sister besmeared with blood, he was softened and said, Let me see what you were reading, so that I may see what Muhammad has brought. Fatima was satisfied with the assurance, but said, O oh brother, you are unclean on account of your idolatry, none but the pure may touch it. So go, and wash first. He did so, and took the page and read the opening verses of the chapter T, H, I until he reached. Verily, I am all L, I L, a illa ana, so worship me and offer prayers perfectly, for my remembrance. Umar read the verses with great interest, and was much entranced with them. How excellent it is, and how graceful. Please guide me to Muhammad, said he. And when he heard that, Kababab came out of concealment and said, O Umar, I hope that all has answered the prayer of the Prophet, for I heard him say, O all, strengthen Islam through either Umar bin al-Khattab or Abu Jal bin Hisham. Umar then left for a house in Safa where Muhammad had been holding secret meetings along with his companions. Umar reached that place with the sword swinging by his arm. He knocked at the door. The companions of the Prophet turned to see who the intruder was. One of them peeped through a chink in the door and reeled back exclaiming, It is Umar with his sword. Hamza, dispelling the fears of his friends, said, Let him in. As a friend he is welcome. As a foe, he will have his head cut off with his own sword. The Prophet asked his companions to open the door. In came the son of Qatab. The Prophet advanced to receive the dreadful visitor, caught him by his garment and scabbard, and asked him the reason of his visit. At that Umar replied, O messenger of all, I come to you in order to believe in all, and his messenger and that which he has brought from his Lord. Filled with delight, Muhammad together with his companions cried aloud, all? You Akbar. The conversion of Umar was a real triumph for the cause of Islam. So great and instant was the effect of his conversion on the situation that the believers who had hitherto worshipped all, within their four walls in secret now assembled and performed their rites of worship openly in the holy sanctuary itself. This raised their spirits, and dread and uneasiness began to seize Quraysh. Ibn Ishaq narrated on the authority of Umar. When I embraced Islam, I remembered the archenemy of Muhammad, Ayy Abu Jal. I set out and knocked at his door. When he came out to see me, I told him directly that I had embraced Islam. He immediately slammed the door repulsively denouncing my move as infamous and my face as ugly. In fact, Umar's conversion created a great deal of stir in Mecca that some people denounced him as an apostate, yet he would never waver in faith, on the contrary, he persisted in his stance even at the peril of his life. The polytheists of Quraysh marched towards his house with the intention of killing him. Abdullah bin Umar narrated, While Umar was at home in a state of fear, there came Alas bin Wail as Sami Abu Amr, wearing an embroidered cloak and a shirt having silk hems. He was from the tribe of Bani Sam who were our allies during the pre-Islamic period of ignorance. Alas said to Umar, What's wrong with you? He said, your people claim that they will kill me if I become a Muslim. Allah said, Nobody will harm you after I have given protection to you. So Allah went out and met the people streaming in the whole valley. He said, Where are you going? They replied, We want son of al Khattab who has embraced Islam. Allah said, There is no way for anybody to touch him. So the people retreated. With respect to the Muslims in Mecca, Umar's conversion had a different tremendous impact. Mujahid, on the authority of Ibn al-Abbas, related that he had asked Umar bin al-Khattab why he had been given the epithet of al-Faruq. He replied, After I had embraced Islam, I asked the Prophet, Aren't we on the right path here and hereafter? The Prophet answered, Of course you are. I swear by all, in whose hand my soul is, that you are right in this world and in the hereafter. I therefore asked the Prophet why we then had to conduct clandestine activism. I swear by all, who has sent you with the truth, that we will leave our concealment and proclaim our noble cause publicly. We then went out in two groups, Hamza leading one and I the other. We headed for the mosque in broad daylight when the polytheists of Quraysh saw us, their faces went pale and got incredibly depressed and resentful. On that very occasion, the Prophet attached to me the epithet of Al-Faruq. 
Ibn Masudi related that they had never been able to observe their religious rites inside the holy sanctuary except when Umar embraced Islam. Su'ib bin Sinan, in the same context, said that it was only after Umar's conversion that we started to proclaim our call, assemble around and circumambulate the sacred house freely. We even dared retaliate against some of the injustices done to harm us. In the same context, Ibn Masudi said, we have been strengthened a lot since Umar embraced Islam. Quraysh's representative negotiates with the messenger of all. Shortly after the conversion of these two powerful heroes, Hamza bin Abdul Muttalib and Umar bin al khattab the clouds of tyranny and oppression started to clear away and the polytheists realized that it was no use meeting out torture to the Muslims. They consequently began to direct their campaign to a different course. The authentic records of the biography of the Prophet show that it had occurred to the Mac and leaders to credit Muhammad with ambition. They, therefore, time and again plied him with temptation. One day some of the important men of Mac gathered in the enclosure of al kaaba and Ibah bin Rabi'ah, a chief among them, offered to approach the Prophet and contract a bargain with him whereby they give him whatever worldly wealth he asks for, on condition that he keeps silent and no longer proclaim his new faith. The people of Quraysh endorsed his proposal and requested him to undertake that task. Urbah came closer to Muhammad and addressed him in the following words, We have seen no other man of Arabia, who has brought so great a calamity to a nation, as you have done. You have outraged our gods and religion and taxed our forefathers and wise men with impiety and error, and created strife amongst us. You have left no stone unturned to estrange the relations with us. If you are doing all this with a view to getting wealth, we will join together to give you greater riches than any Quraishite has possessed. If ambition moves you, we will make you our chief. If you desire kingship, we will readily offer you that. If you are under the power of an evil spirit which seems to haunt and dominate you so that you cannot shake off its yoke, then we shall call in skillful physicians to cure you. Have you said all? asked Muhammad. And then hearing that all had been said, he spoke forth and said, In the name of all, the most beneficent, the most merciful. H. M., a revelation from all, the most beneficent, the most merciful. A book whereof the verses are explained in detail. Occur. In Arabic for people who know. Giving glad tidings, of paradise to the one who believes in the oneness of all, and fears all. Much, abstains from all kinds of sins and evil deeds. And loves all, much and warning, but most of them turn away, so they listen not. And they say, Our hearts are under coverings from that to which you invite us. The messenger of all went on reciting the chapter, while Utbah sitting and listening attentively with his hand behind his back to support him. When the messenger reached the verse that required prostration, he immediately prostrated himself. After that, he turned to Utbah saying, Well, Abu al Walid, you have heard my reply. You are now free to do whatever you please. Ibbah then retired to his company to apprise them of the Prophet's attitude. When his compatriots saw him, they swore that he had returned to them with a countenance unlike the one he had before meeting the Prophet. He immediately communicated to them the details of the talk he gave and the reply he received, and appended saying, I have never heard words similar to those ones he recited. They definitely relate neither to poetry nor to witchcraft nor do they derive from soothsaying. O people of Quraysh, I request you to heed my advice and grant the man full freedom to pursue his goals, in which case you could safely detach yourselves from him. I swear that his words bear a supreme message. Should the other Arabs rid you of him, they will then spare you the trouble. On the other hand, if he accedes to power over the Arabs, then you will bask in his kingship and share him his might. These words of course fell on deaf ears, and did not appeal to the infidels, who jeered at Ibah and claimed that the prophet had bewitched him. In another version of the same event, it is related that Ibah went on attentively listening to the prophet until the latter began to recite all s words. But if they turn away, they say, I have warned you of a saika like the saika which overtook Ad and Tam. Here Ibah stood up panicked, and stunned putting his hand on the prophet's mouth beseeching him. I beg you in the name of all, and uterine ties to stop lest the calamity should befall the people of Quraysh. He then hurriedly returned to his compatriots, and informed them of what he had heard. 
Abu Talib assembles Bani Hashim and Bani Almadalib the new and welcome changes notwithstanding, Abu Talib still had a deep sensation of fear over his nephew. He deliberated on the previous series of incidents including the barter affair of Amara bin al-Walid, Abu Jal's rock, Uqba's attempt to choke the Prophet, and finally Umar's intention to kill Muhammad. The wise man understood that all of these unequivocally smacked of a serious plot being hatched to disregard his status as a custodian of the Prophet, and kill the latter publicly. In the event of such a thing, Abu Talib deeply believed, either Umar nor Hamza would be of any avail, socially powerful though they were. Abu Talib was right. The polytheists had laid a carefully studied plan to kill the Prophet, and banded together to put their plan into effect. He therefore, assembled his kinsfolk of Bani Hashim and Bani Almadalib, sons of Abd Minaf, and exhorted them to immunize and defend his nephew. All of them, whether believers or disbelievers, responded positively except his brother Abu Lahab, who sided with the idolaters. General social boycott for events of special significance occurred within less than four weeks. The conversion of Hamza, the conversion of Umar, Muhammad's refusal to negotiate any sort of compromise and then the pact drawn up between Banu Mudalib and Banu Hashim to immunize Muhammad and shield him against any treacherous attempt to kill him. The polytheists were baffled and at a loss as to what course they would follow to rid themselves of this obstinate and relentless obstacle that had appeared to shatter to pieces their whole tradition of life. They had already been aware that if they killed Muhammad their blood would surely flow profusely in the valleys of Mecca and they would certainly be exterminated. Taking this dreadful prospect into consideration, they grudgingly resorted to a different iniquitous course that would not imply murder. A pact of injustice and aggression the pagans of Mecca held a meeting in a place called Wadi al-Muhasib and formed a confederation hostile to both Bani Hashim and Bani al mudalib they decided not to have any business dealings with them nor any sort of intermarriage. Social relations, visits, and even verbal contacts with Muhammad and his supporters would discontinue until the Prophet was given up to them to be killed. The articles of their proclamation, which had provided for merciless measures against Bani Hashim, were committed to writing by an idolater, Baghi bin Amir bin Hashim, and then suspended in al kaba the Prophet invoked Allah's imprecations upon Baghid, whose hand was later paralyzed. Abu Talib wisely and quietly took stock of the situation and decided to withdraw to a valley on the eastern outskirts of Mecca. Banu Hashim and Banu al who followed suit, were thus confined within a narrow pass, from the beginning of Muharram, the seventh year of Muhammad's mission till the tenth year, viz. a period of three years. It was a stifling siege. The supply of food was almost stopped, and the people in confinement faced great hardships. The idolaters used to buy whatever food commodities entered Mecca lest they should leak to the people in Ashurbi, who were so overstrained that they had to eat leaves of trees and skins of animals. Cries of little children suffering from hunger used to be heard clearly. Nothing to eat reached them except, on few occasions, some meager quantities of food were smuggled by some compassionate Maccans. During the prohibited months, when hostilities traditionally ceased, they would leave their confinement and buy food coming from outside Mecca. Even then, the foodstuff was unjustly overpriced so that their financial situation would fall short of finding access to it. Hakim bin Hizm was once on his way to smuggle some wheat to his aunt Khadija C when Abu Jal intercepted and wanted to debar him. Only when al Bukhtari intervened did Hakim manage to reach his destination. Abu Talib was so much concerned about the personal safety of his nephew. Whenever people retired to sleep, he would ask the Prophet to lie in his place. But when all the others fell asleep, he would order him to change his place and take another, all of which in an attempt to trick a potential assassin. Despite all odds, Muhammad persisted in his line and his determination and courage never weakened. He continued to go to al kaaba and to pray publicly. He used every opportunity to preach to outsiders who visited Mecca for business or on pilgrimage during the sacred months and special seasons of assemblies. This situation ultimately created dissension amongst the various Meccan factions, who were tied with the besieged people by blood relations. After three years of blockade and in Muharram, the tenth year of Muhammad's mission, the pact was broken. Hisham bin Amr, who used to smuggle some food to Bani Hashim secretly at night, 
went to see Zuhair bin Abi Omeya al Maksimi and reproached him for resigning to that intolerable treatment meted out to his uncles in exile. The latter pleaded impotence, but agreed to work with Asham and form a pressure group that would secure the extrication of the exiles. On the ground of motivation by uterine relations, there emerged a group of five people who set out to abrogate the pact and declare all relevant clauses null and void. They were Hisham bin Amr, Zuhair bin Abi Omaya, al bin Adi, Abu al-Bukhtari, and Zamay bin al-Aswad. They decided to meet in their assembly place and start their self-charged mission from the very precinct of the sacred house. Zuhair, after circumambulating seven times, along with his colleagues approached the hosts of people there and rebuked them for indulging in the amenities of life whereas their kith and kin of Bani Hashem were perishing on account of starvation and economic boycott. They swore they would never relent until the parchment of boycott was torn to peace and the pact broken at once. Abu Jal, standing nearby, retorted that it would never be torn. Zame was infuriated and accused Abu Jal of telling lies, adding that the pact was established and the parchment was written without seeking their approval. Al-Bukhtari intervened and backed Zame. al mutaim bin Adi and Hisham bin Amr attested to the truthfulness of their two companions. Abu Jal with a cunning attempt to liquidate the hot argument that was running counter to his malicious goals, answered that the issue had already been resolved some time and somewhere before. Abu Talib, meanwhile, was sitting in a corner of the mosque. He came to communicate to them that a revelation had been sent to his nephew, the prophet to the effect that ants had eaten away all their proclamation that smacked of injustice and aggression except those parts that bore the name of Allah. He contended that he would be ready to give Muhammad up to them if his words proved untrue, otherwise, they would have to recant and repeal their boycott. The Mackins agreed to the soundness of his proposition. al went to see the parchment, and there he did discover that it was eaten away by ants, and nothing was left save the part bearing. The proclamation was thus abrogated, and Muhammad and the other people were permitted to leave Ash Shib and return home. In the context of this trial to which the Muslims were subjected, the polytheists had a golden opportunity to experience a striking sign of Muhammad's prophethood but to their miserable lot they desisted and augmented in disbelief. But if they see a sign, they turn away and say this is continuous magic. The final phase of the diplomacy of negotiation the messenger of Allah left his confinement and went on preaching his faith as usual. Quraysh, likewise, repealed the boycott but went on in their atrocities and oppression on the Muslims. Abu Talib, the octogenarian notable, was still keen on shielding his nephew but by that time, and on account of the series of tremendous events and continual pains, he began to develop certain fits of weakness. No sooner had he emerged victorious from the inhuman boycott than he was caught in a persistent illness and physical enervation. The polytheists of Mecca Seeing this serious situation and fearing that the stain of infamy that the other Arabs could attribute to them in case they took any aggressive action against the Prophet after he had lost his main support, Abu Talib, took a decision to negotiate with the Prophet once more and submit some concessions withheld previously. They then delegated some representatives to see Abu Talib and discuss the issue with him. Ibn Ishaq and others related. When a serious illness caught Abu Talib, the people of Quraysh began to deliberate on the situation and reviewed the main features that characterized that period and which included the conversion of Umar and Hamza to Islam, coupled with the tremendous stir that Muhammad had created amongst all the tribes of Quraysh. They then deemed it imperative to see Abu Talib before he died to pressure his nephew to negotiate a compromise on the various disputed points. They were afraid that the other Arabs might attribute to them the charge of opportunism. The delegation of Quraysh comprised twenty-five men including notables like Ubah bin Rabi'a, Shaiba bin Rabi'a, Abu Jal bin Hisham, Omeya bin Khalif, Abu Sufyan bin Harb. They first paid tribute to him and confirmed their high esteem of his person and position among them. They then shifted to the new give-and-take policy that they claimed they wanted to follow. To substantiate their argument they alleged that they would refrain from intervening in his religion if he did the same. Abu Talib summoned his nephew and apprised him of the minutes of his meeting with them, and said, Well, my nephew, here are the celebrities of your people. They have proposed this meeting to submit a policy of mutual concessions and peaceful coexistence. The Messenger of Allah turned to them saying, 
I will guide you to the means by which you will gain sovereignty over both the Arabs and non-Arabs. In another version, the prophet addressed Abu Talib in the following words, O uncle, why don't you call them unto something better? Abu Talib asked him, What is it that you invite them to? The prophet replied, I invite them to hold fast to a message that is bound to give them access to kingship over the Arabs and non-Arabs. According to Ibn Ishaq's version, it is just one word that will give you supremacy over the Arabs and non-Arabs. The Mackin deputies were taken by incredible surprise and began to wonder what sort of word was that which would benefit them to that extent. Abu Jal asked, What is that word? I swear by your father that we will surely grant you your wish followed by ten times as much. He said, I want you to testify that there is no God worthy to be worshipped but Allah, and then divest yourselves of any sort of worship you harbor for any deities other than Allah. They immediately clapped their hands in ridicule and said, How can you expect us to combine all the deities in one God? It is really something incredible. On their way out leaving, they said to one another, By God this man, Muhammad, will never relent, nor will he offer any concessions. Let us hold fast to the religion of our forefathers, and Allah H. will in due course adjudicate and settle the dispute between us and him. As regards this incident, Allah revealed the following verses. Sad. By the current full of reminding. Nay, those who disbelieve are in false pride and apposition. How many a generation we have destroyed before them, and they cried out when there was no longer time for escape and they wonder that a warner has come to them from among themselves. And the disbelievers say, This is a sorcerer, a liar. Has he made the gods into one god? Verily, this is a curious thing. And the leaders among them went about, Go on, and remain constant to your gods. Verily, this is a thing designed. We have not heard of this among the people of these later days. This is nothing but an invention. The year of grief Abu Talib's death in Rajab, the tenth year of the prophethood, Abu Talib fell ill and passed away, six months after leaving the confinement at Ash Shaibi. In another version, Abu Talib breathed his last in Ramadan, three days prior to the death of Khadija. On the authority of al Muzayyab, when Abu Talib was on the deathbed, the prophet entered the room where he saw Abu Jal and Abdullah bin Abi Omeya. He requested his uncle. My uncle, you just make a profession that there is no true God but Allah, and I will bear testimony before Allah. Abu Jal and Abdullah bin Abi Omeya addressing him said, Abu Talib, would you abandon the religion of Abdul Muttalib? The messenger of Allah constantly requested him, and was repeated the same statement, till Abu Talib gave his final decision and he stuck to the religion of Abdul Muttalib and refused to profess that there is no true God but Allah. Upon this the messenger of Allah remarked, By Allah, I will persistently beg pardon for you till I am forbidden to do so. It was then that Allah, the Magnificent and Glorious, revealed this verse. It is not for the Prophet and those who believe to ask Allah's forgiveness for the mushrikin even though they be of kin, after it has become clear to them that they are the dwellers of the fire. And it was said to the messenger of Allah, Verily, you guide not whom you like. It goes without saying that Abu Talib was very much attached to Muhammad. For forty years, Abu Talib had been the faithful friend, the prop of his childhood, the guardian of his youth, and in later life a very tower of defense. The sacrifices to which Abu Talib exposed himself and his family for the sake of his nephew, while yet incredulous of his mission, stamp his character as singularly noble and unselfish. The Prophet did his best to persuade his octogenarian uncle to make profession of Tihi true faith, but he remained obdurate and stuck to the paganism of his forefathers, and thus could not achieve complete success. Al Abbas bin Abdul Muttalib narrated that he said to the Prophet, You have not been of any avail to your uncle by Allah, he used to protect you and get angry on your behalf. The Prophet said, He is in a shallow fire, and had it not been for me, he would have been at the bottom of the fire. Abu Sa'id al-Qudri narrated that he heard the Prophet say, when the mention of his uncle was made, I hope that my intercession may avail him, and he be placed in a shallow fire that rises up only to his heels. Khadija passes away to the mercy of Allah only two months after the death of his uncle, did the messenger of Allah experience another great personal loss viz, 
the mother of believers, his wife Khadija passed away in Ramadan of the tenth year of his prophethood, when she was sixty-five years old, and he was fifty. Khadija was in fact a blessing of Allah for the prophet. She, for twenty-five years, shared with him the toils and trials of life, especially in the first ten years of his ministry of prophethood. He deeply mourned over her death, and once he replied in an honest burst of tender emotions, She believed in me when none else did. She embraced Islam when people disbelieved me. And she helped and comforted me in her person and wealth when there was none else to lend me a helping hand. I had children from her only. Abu Huraira reported that Gabriel came to Allah's messenger and said, Allah's messenger, lo, Khadija is coming to you with a vessel of seasoned food or drink. When she comes to you, offer her greetings from her Lord, and give her glad tidings of a palace of jewels and paradise where there is no noise and no toil. These two painful events took place within a short lapse of time and added a lot to his grief and suffering. The Mackins now openly declared their campaign of torture and oppression. The Prophet lost all hope of bringing them back to the right path, so he set out for Altai of seeking a supportive atmosphere. But there too, he was disappointed and he sustained unbearable tortures and maltreatment that far outweighed his miserable situation in his native town. His companions were on equal footing subjected to unspeakable torture and unbearable oppression to such an extent that his closest friend, Abu Bakr, to escape pressure, fled out of Mecca and wanted to leave for Abyssinia if it were not for Ibn Ad-Dagana who met him at Bark al gamid and managed to dissuade him from completing his journey of escape and brought him back under his protection. The death of Abu Talib rendered the Prophet vulnerable and the polytheists availed them of that opportunity to give free rein to their hatred and high-handedness, and to translate them in terms of oppression and physical tortures. Once an insolent Quraishite intercepted him and sprinkled sand on his head. When he arrived home, a daughter of his washed the sand away and wept. Do not weep, my daughter. Allah will verily protect your father, the Prophet said. Rapid succession of misfortunes led the Prophet to call that period the year of grief and mourning. Thenceforth, that year bore that appellation. His marriage to Sada and Shawal, the tenth year of prophethood the death of Khadija left the prophet lonely. The name of Sada was suggested to him for marriage which he accepted. This lady had suffered many hardships for the sake of Islam. She was an early convert to the Islamic faith, and it was by her persuasion that her husband had embraced Islam. On the second emigration to Abyssinia, Sada had accompanied her husband as Sakran bin Amr. He died on their way back to Mecca leaving her in a terrible state of destitution. She was the first woman for the Prophet to marry after the death of Khadija. Some years later she granted her turn with the Prophet to her co-wife, Aisha. The third phase, calling unto Islam beyond Mecca and Shawal, ten years after receiving his mission from his Lord, the Prophet set out towards Ataif, about sixty kilometers from Mecca in the company of his freed slave Zayed bin Harita inviting people to Islam. But contrary to his expectations, the general atmosphere was terribly hostile. He approached the family of Umair, who were reckoned amongst the nobility of the town. But to his disappointment, all of them turned deaf ear to his message and used abusive language as regards the noble cause he had been striving for. Three brothers from the chieftains of Thaqif, Abd Yalil, Masyudi and Habib, Sons of Amr bin Umar Adh Thakafi met the Prophet, who invited them to embrace Islam and worship Allah, but they impudently jeered at him and refused his invitation. He is tearing the cloths of Al Kaaba. Is it true that Allah has sent you as a messenger? said one of them. Has not Allah found someone else to entrust him with his message? said the second. I swear by Allah that I will never have any contact with you. If you are really the messenger of Allah, then you are too serious to retort back, and if you are belying Allah, then I feel it is imperative not to speak to, said the third. The messenger of Allah, finding that they were hopeless cases, stood up and left them, saying, Should you indulge in these practices of yours, never divulge them to me. For ten days he stayed there delivering his message to several people, one after another, but all to no purpose. Stirred up to hasten the departure of the unwelcome visitor, the people hooted him through the alleyways, pelted him with stones and obliged him to flee from the city pursued by a relentless rabble. 
blood flowed down both his legs, and Zaid, endeavoring to shield him, was wounded in the head. The mob did not desist until they had chased him two or three miles across the sandy plains to the foot of the surrounding hills. There, wearied and exhausted, he took refuge in one of the numerous orchards, and rested against the wall of a vineyard. At a time when the whole world seemed to have turned against him, Muhammad turned to his Lord and betook himself to prayer, and the following touching words are still preserved as those through which his oppressed soul gave vent to its distress. He was weary and wounded but confident of the help of his Lord. O Allah! To you alone I make complaint of my helplessness, the paucity of my resources and my insignificance before mankind. You are the most merciful of the mercifuls. You are the Lord of the helpless and the weak, O Lord of mine. Into whose hands would you abandon me, into the hands of an unsympathetic distant relative who would sullenly frown at me, or to the enemy who has been given control over my affairs? But if your wrath does not fall on me, there is nothing for me to worry about. I seek protection in the light of your countenance, which illuminates the heavens and dispels darkness, and which controls all affairs in this world as well as in the hereafter. May it never be that I should incur your wrath or that you should be wrathful to me. And there is no power nor resource, but yours alone. Seeing him in this helpless situation, Rabia's two sons, wealthy Mackins, were moved on grounds of kinship and compassion, and sent to him one of their Christian servants with a tray of grapes. The prophet accepted the fruit with pious invocation, in the name of the Allah. The Christian servant Adas was greatly impressed by these words and said, these are words which people in this land do not generally use. The prophet inquired of him whence he came and what religion he professed. Adas replied, I am a Christian by faith and come from Nineveh. The prophet then said, You belong to the city of the righteous Jonah, son of Mada. Adas asked him anxiously if he knew anything about Jonah. The prophet significantly remarked, He is my brother. He was a prophet, and so am I. Thereupon Adas paid homage to Muhammad and kissed his hands. His masters admonished him at this act, but he replied, None on the earth is better than he is. He has revealed to me a truth which only a prophet can do. They again reprimanded him and said, We forewarn you against the consequences of abandoning the faith of your forefathers. The religion which you profess is far better than the one you feel inclined to. Heartbroken and depressed, Muhammad set out on the way back to Mecca. When he reached Karn al Manazil, Allah, the Almighty sent him Gabriel together with the Angel of Mountains. The latter asked the Prophet for permission to bury Mecca between Al, Akshabain, Abu Kubays, and Chuaika in mountains. Full narration of this event was given by Aisha. She said, I asked the Prophet if he had ever experienced a worse day than Ahud. He answered that he had suffered a lot from those people, but the most painful was on the day of Aqaba. I went seeking support from Ibn Abd Yal bin Abd Kal, but he spurned me. I set out wearied and grieved heedless of anything around me until I suddenly realized I was in Karn Adich Thalib, called Karn al Manazil. There, I looked up and saw a cloud casting its shade on me, and Gabriel addressing me, Allah has heard your people's words and sent you the angel of mountains to your aid. The latter called and gave me his greetings and asked for my permission to bury Makkah between al Akshabain the two mountains flanking Mecca. I said in reply that I would rather have someone from their loins who will worship Allah, the Almighty with no associate. A concise meaningful answer fully indicative of the Prophet's matchless character and the fathomless magnanimous manners. The messenger of Allah then came back to wakefulness, and his heart was set at rest in the light of that invisible divinely provided aid. He proceeded to Wadi Nakla where he stayed for a few days. During his stay there, Allah sent him a company of jinns who listened to him reciting the noble Quran. And when we sent towards you Nafran of the jinns, listening to the Quran, when they stood in the presence thereof, they said, Listen in silence. And when it was finished, they returned to their people as warners. They said, O our people, verily, we have heard a book sent down after Moses, confirming what came before it, it guides to the truth and to a straight path. O our people, Respond to Allah's caller, I Allah's messenger Muhammad, and believe in him. He will forgive you of your sins, and will save you from a painful torment. The same incident is referred to in Surah Al-Jin. Say.
It has been revealed to me that a group of jinns listened. They said, Verily, we have heard a wonderful recital. It guides to the right path, and we have believed therein, and we shall never join anything with our Lord. Till the end of the fifteenth verse. From the context of these verses and their relevant interpretation, we can safely establish it that the Prophet was not aware of the presence of that group of jinns. It was only when Allah revealed those verses that he came to know of it. The verses also confirm that it was the first time they came. However, the context of the different versions suggests that the jinns repeated their visits later on. The presence of that company of jinns comes in the context of the divine support given to his messenger and constitutes a propitious sign of ultimate victory and success for the call of Islam. It provides an unshakable proof that no power however mighty could alter what is wrought by Allah. And whosoever does not respond to Allah's caller, he cannot escape on earth, and there will be no aliyah from him besides Allah. Those are in manifest error. And we think that we cannot escape Allah H in the earth, nor can we escape by flight. Given this support and auspicious start, depression, dismay and sadness that used to beset him since he was driven out of Ataif, he turned his face towards Mecca with fresh determination to resume his earlier plan to expose people to Islam and communicate his message in a great spirit of zeal and matchless enthusiasm. Zaid bin Haritha, his companion, addressing the Prophet said, How dare you step into Mecca after they have expatriated you? The Prophet answered, Hearken Zaid, Allah will surely provide relief and he will verily support his religion and Prophet. When he was a short distance from Mecca, he retired to hear a cave. Whence he dispatched a man from Khuzar tribe to Alaknas bin Shuraik seeking his protection. The latter answered that he was Quraysh's ally and in no position to offer protection. He dispatched a messenger to Suhail bin Amr, but to no avail, either. al mudaim bin Adi, a notable in Mecca, however, volunteered to respond to the Prophet's appeal for shelter. He asked his people to prepare themselves fully armed and then asked Muhammad to enter into the town and directly into the holy sanctuary. The Prophet observed a two-racket prayer and left for his house guarded by the heavily armed vigilant Adis. It has been reported that later Abu Jal, the archenemy of Islam, asked Muhammad if his behavior suggested protection or conversion, the latter replied it was merely protection. Abu Jal was relieved and said that he would give Muhammad protection for his sake. The Messenger of Allah never forgot Mutaim's favor. At the conclusion of the Battle of Badr, he declared publicly that if Mutaim had been still alive and asked for the release of the Quraishite captives, he would not deny him his request. Ibn